Okay, I'm going to be uh, starting now then, it's 2.30. Uh, welcome to um, the second uh, of the series of Lightning webinars. Um, today we're going to be going through uh, some data sampling with Lightning. So my name is Nick Mikowski. I'm the uh, Scientific Support Specialist with 80 Instruments. And uh, I'll be going through today with you just how we can record some data with Lightning and um, you know, the different tools that Lightning has in recording the data, some um, sample conditioning, uh, go through the, uh, the DVM or the, the, the view that you see when, with your data and, uh, and also some basic calculations as well and also to drop some annotations. So I'm just gonna start this fresh. So what I've done is I do have a Power Lab connected um, with a BioAmp and a BridgeAmp. So I'll be recording some ECG data. And also I have um, a blood, blood pressure transducer connected. So I'll be doing a two point calibration as well. So first thing I'm gonna do is just click on the Lightning icon. And if this is the first time you're using Lightning, uh, you're gonna come up with a window like this. So this is just to create a, or open a project. So I did I mentioned this in the, well, emphasize what projects mean in the last webinar, but just to go over that quickly, um, the way Lightning works is that you have your recordings. So these recordings are basically your lab chart files. So, you know, when you feel familiar with lab chart eight, you have your, your lab chart files. And of course, you probably categorize these files, I mean, these lab chart, you know, these files into other folders. And a folder, you know, is essentially what a project is. So the project can be thought of as a theme or a study. And what we can do in Lightning is have multiple projects, as many as you like really, in the same Lightning program. So then that way, uh, one student or a researcher can jump from one project to another seamlessly without worrying to going through, you know, going from one folder and digging up the folders. It's, you know, all the files, it's a really easy way of um, putting it together. So as I'm just gonna be starting fresh, I'm just gonna create a new project. I'm just gonna go to file and a new project. And as I expand my uh, window here, the first thing you'll notice is that it's scanning for a device. Apart from the fact if you're not familiar with lighting at all, um, it's totally black. Uh, this can be of course changed under the view and the switch to light theme mode. Uh, I personally prefer the black. It just makes the colors pop a little bit more for me personally. So I'm just gonna keep it in the dark theme mode. And let's just say, let's just start with, um, you know, connecting a device here. So since it's already connected, I'm just gonna remove this and show you how to do it if you didn't have a device connected. So let's just say you open up Lightning and then you decide to plug in your device. So what you have to do is click on your devices and then you have to click on add device. And from here, it will search for uh, Power Lab. In this case, there's my 835. Go click on that and then add device. And then immediately it'll show me uh, eight channels. That's because there's, there's eight channels in this Power Lab with eight signals. So the way uh, Power Lab work, I mean, with the Lightning works is that you have the channels corresponding to how many, channel, how many inputs you have within um, your Power Lab. So like I said, mine has eight. And there's also eight signals. And but these signals themselves can be moved any way you like. You don't have to keep them all under one channel. So that's something that's, you know, vastly different from what we are familiar with um, in lab chart eight. So I can just put these back. So what we're gonna do a little bit later on in the webinar is I'll be superimposing uh, this data together, whether or not it's just from raw data or maybe just from calculated data, putting it together. That way it's easier to see if there's any trends. Um, you know, you can look at your data, you know, in real time that way. It could be a fairly effective way of analyzing the data as well. So as we have devices there, you'll notice that the start option is open here. And if you also notice that anywhere I do move my cursor, this uh, pop-up here will tell you just a briefly, you know, what you can do uh, with these with these options. So that's just, that's what it means. If, the, if that you're, I guess, distracted in the top right there. Uh, other basic features here is we have our start, time starter block and day. Um, we have our regular reset layout. So if you have your layouts, you know, in a, in a certain way, but you want to reset that, you have the option of doing it here. 
And then here, when we add some data, uh, this will be an auto scale function. So you can just auto scale this way as well. But there's another way to do that. And I'll show, I'll go through that with you as well. Option here is the sampling. So um, by default, we are at one kilohertz sampling here. Um, so what that simply means is that for every second, there'll be 1000 samples taken. This can be of course changed. So what we have now is defaulted at 1000 um, samples per second for all my channels. But if I choose to click on this, which I do recommend, the multi-rate sampling, what that does for me now is that I have the ability or the flexibility really to change um, any um, sampling, you know, any sampling I want per channel. So it's, it's a convenient way for you to change your sampling rates. And well, why would you want to change your sampling rates? So that just depends on the type of data you're looking at. Um, typically, 1,000 is, is enough um, for most people. But if you're looking into something like spike, like, you know, we're looking at spikes in your data, then having a faster sampling rate may be of importance. So 20,000 or 100,000 may be really important. Uh, but if you have a lot of data, a lot of samples running, then um, that could mean also you have a large file. So then having a lower sampling rate, if that doesn't um, affect your um, collecting of the data, then that can help you um, save some space in your file. So we're just gonna keep this at one kilohertz and the same thing here, one kilohertz. And uh, yeah, the same for all these for the moment. As these, I'm not gonna be really using um, the first um, four inputs, so I will remove these, but You'll notice that um, the ranges are different for the first two. Uh, the range just means the range of data we have. So if you see whatever value here is here, it's going to be plus and minus that value. So since I have a front end connected to the Power Lab one and two, so the, the first one is a is a you know, is a bioamp, which can be used for your biopotentials such as an ECG that I'm hooked onto at the moment, or and this one here is a five volt is to do with my bridge amp, which I'll be using to calibrate the blood pressure transducer. And if nothing's connected um, to the power lab, in this particular power lab, um, it gives you a 10 volt um, default. So as I'm just gonna keep them like this, um, the next option then is, uh, as I've already spoken to the devices, um, when, before we start the data, it's important to collect the correct range and add any sort of filtering if you need it um, for your data. So that's, uh, that's what we're gonna do now. So uh, the input one is connected to my bioamp. So that's the ECG. So the first thing to do when I do click here is that I'm given a few options. So Lightning, um, if you are familiar, if you're familiar with Lab Chart 8, um, you know, it can get fairly complicated how much, like, you know, volume of information there is. So Lightning's trying to simplify things, make things a bit easier for you. Um, so it's easier and uh, intuitive for someone that has never started before. They can just pick up on it and just um, you know, learn fairly quickly. So what I'm gonna do, I can actually change the name here. Let's just say that's gonna be my ECG. And I can change the color if I want. So there's a bit of a spectrum there, of whatever colors you like. Uh, sampling, we'll go through that. That simply just talks about the sampling. Um, so the range, and we can add some filtering or re-zeroing is here. Um, if you notice the three dots, the, uh, they're fairly synonymous throughout um, lightning. So anywhere you see a three dot, so here, 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 or even even here, uh, that just means properties and settings. So if you see this, it's a fairly important um, button to press. So you can just press on that and it'll give you the options. Uh, the units conversion is something I'll go through more in the bridge amp. We'll go through a little bit later on in the webinar. And I'll go through these also um, a little bit later on. So that's specifically with the readout. Um, that's the same thing as the DVM. So the window you see with Lab Chart 8, you can drag that out of the channel to display your units. That's the same thing here um, with, a, some, with a, lot of, a little bit of a tweak to it. And I'll show you what that means. Um, you have the option of remove from channel. So what you have here is if you had these um, signals all in one channel, for example, but let's just say the signal wasn't really of importance, you can um, click on it and you can actually remove that signal from the channel as well. So we just put that back. Um, calculations, that's something that we will go talk, talk, talk about today. So that's gonna be some, we'll go through some basic calculations of what you can do. So it's a la cyclic measurements, um, digital filters, smoothing, um, integrals, different differentiations. You know, we, we'll go through, through a few of those today. 
Uh, also in the channel, we have these two other options here. Um, this one shows you an option to maximize. So if I want to, I, I can click on this and this will be a little bit easier once I actually collect some data, but you'll see that once I click on this, only that channel will be visible and everything else will be hidden for that moment. But if I click on that option again, then it'll go back to its original, original position. And these options here are my channel properties. So remember we have signal properties, which is the signal here, but we also have the channel properties. And that's the three options here, three dots. Here you can just change the scale if you need, or you can auto scale. Um, here it shows me that my signal in this channel is ECG, but I have the option of adding more signals here as well. So as I mentioned, you can just left click and drag the signal into a channel, but you, all can, you can also do it this way as well. And if I click on this, this option simply takes me to the same um, properties as my signal as I originally mentioned. I also have an option to remove a channel here. So we can remove a signal, but we can also remove a channel. So this, this is one of the ways you can do it. You can do it this way, or you can also right click and do it this way as well. A good note to make here before I record the data is that the options you have with um, your channel and your signal, um, even, um, re you know, even um, to do with resizing and auto scaling, all can be found quickly by right clicking and it gives you a shortcut to these properties as well. So auto scaling, like I mentioned, adding channels, you can remove a channel, show readout, that's also there as well. So this is fairly important, I think here, because if you have a lot of signals in one channel, by clicking on the readout, all the, all the readouts will co come out simultaneously for you. So that saves you a bit of time. And here, just once again, just going through the properties of the ECG. So quite a few shortcuts by simply right clicking instead of having to go through these options here. So now to go back to the sampling, um, if I click on these properties, what you'll see, actually what you should see, but unfortunately you don't, I'm just gonna quickly close this, my apologies. It's amazing what happens when you're uh, doing it live. I'm gonna start that again. So what you should see a preview actually of the signal. So click on here and go to sampling. Ah, I have to wait for this to actually, okay, it's found the power lab. Click on here again. All right, now we got it. So what you're gonna see here is, hmm, just gonna DC restore. Multi rates on, I think something is wrong. Okay, I'm just gonna change this to five millivolts. And, okay, that's, shouldn't show that, but actually should show a smooth signal. So I'm just gonna quickly go through this as we continue on. But what you see here is the rate of the sampling rate we mentioned before, uh, the range. So it's important to have a range that is, so whatever the, your signal is, just make sure to find the optimum range by having whatever the maximum signal is. So let's just say in this case, it'd be about two millivolts. We wanna double that plus a little bit more. So here, five millivolts should actually work out fine. Um, with this bioamp, it gives me a high pass filter of 0.1 Hertz and also a DC restore. So that just helps me zero my signal. I'm also gonna apply a mains filter, which will just help me um, condition this signal as there will be a bit of uh, mains noise, which is 50 Hertz. And the mains filter just helps with um, dynamically um, conditioning the signal as it um, as it uh, enters into the, into the power lab. So if I click apply, and let's hoping this all works for me. If I click on start, okay. I think what we're seeing here is. Hmm. My apologies, I'm just gonna close this one because this should be actually a lot smoother than this. Um, I'm just gonna do a new recording. Gonna go to devices, yep, that's there. multi rates there. Going to go to sampling. Okay, 
So now you can actually see the proper signal there. So I do apologize for that um, technical difficulty, but you can clearly see the signals popped up there for my ECG. And now I'm just going to modify the uh, range down to five millivolts. And you can see that it is fairly noisy, but that's totally normal for an ECG. And we do recommend to add the mains filter here. So it takes a few seconds to adapt. And as it cleans up, we're now going to click apply. Okay, now we're going to press start. So you can see the signal now is being recorded here on the left. And as I'm recording, you can see a live, um, wherever I move my cursor, is the live uh, millivolt of that reading at that moment. So you can see it there. So as I mentioned before, I'm just going to press the uh, maximize option here first. So you can clearly see my signal. So that's a good ECG signal there. Um, so, and the top you'll notice these colorful display is just my overview. So this overview just tells me the overview of what I have at the moment. So anywhere I click on the overview, it will take me there. So the longer this recording goes, um, it's gonna be you know, obviously larger here as well. So if I wanna go back to my live feed, I'm just gonna click on the right and go back to my live feed. So you can clearly see my signal there. The next thing I do wanted to talk about with you um, with this was if you like, I think we did mention this in the last webinar, more to do with uh, um, how you can actually you know, manipulate this signal. So you can actually not manipulate, but rather just view it. So you can use your scroll wheel on your, um, on your mouse. So you can scroll in and you can scroll out and you can um, clearly do that here. So it's fairly easy to uh, work with if you want. You can also move your cursor over the scale and scroll in and out and you can see the scale change as well. Alternatively, if you are left click and hold on the overview, you can actually and move your mouse up and down. You can actually zoom in and out that way as well, or you can zoom in and out just with the scroll wheel. And the same thing with the scale here, you can left click and move the mouse right to left and you can change the scale this way. So there's plenty of flexibility on how you can view the data without having to worry about adding plus and minus, you know, here as you're used to with lab chart eight. So if we go back to our live feed, Next thing I want to talk about with you was annotations. So I'm just going to close this for a moment. And what you'll see on the right here is our properties. Uh, this pane, this property is our window pane here. You'll see it um, changes depending on what we're seeing. So right now it's um, in a chart views properties, but if I click anywhere on the chart, it will show me a selection properties. And the selection properties can be helpful when you're looking at regions, uh, which we aren't going to talk too much about today but also can be helpful um, you know, when you want to export your data. But to go back to the chart view properties, just make sure this really important button up here is our show properties, which returns us back to here. So to talk a little bit about this um, properties here and um, a little bit about this. So this is a new project of mine. So I'm just going to change this. So you can notice there's a few um, tabs here. So the recordings just talk about, okay, what recordings we have. So there's only one recording in this project at the moment, but the more recordings I'll put in, well, actually there's two. This is from the old one, which I had some problems with, and this is the new recording. And that's what the, um, the tabs are. The search recordings is like a little mini search engine you have for yourself. So this is a really important uh, when you're searching for annotations, um, when you've added tags, I'll talk about that soon. And if you're just looking into different types of, um, you know, whatever sort of comments you've added to your channel or to your recordings, you can search for it there. It's a really handy tip, really handy thing to have. The groupings, I did mention this, I think, in the last webinar, but we'll talk about this more, or emphasize this more in the cross file analysis webinar coming up in a fortnight. But you can actually group your data together if you're having multiple subjects um, as an example. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Annotations, you can search for your annotations here. So what I'm going to do is drop some annotations for you and the project here. So the project theme, I'm just going to call this a practice, Nick, you know, not very original, but it's fine. And that's going to be my project for that. So any, any recordings that I record now by going to new recording or file new recording here, as you can see, they'll all be under the umbrella of uh, Nick's or practice Nick. That's all under that umbrella. But if you want to, you can add a new project and then they can, your new recordings can be under that project and you can easily move from project to project by going to recent projects. But of course I have this recording at the moment. If I stop that, <coughs> I can have, I can go to any project 
that I wish. But I digress, I'll um, continue with my recording here. So what I'm gonna show you with the annotations is you have the options of dropping annotations several ways. The first way is you can add something. So let's just say, let's add a baseline as a, as a comment. So you can either add an annotation by pressing F4 like that, and you can see the baseline there, and you can see it's hollow there, or you can press enter, or you can press add. Notice this second um, row, edit last. What that means is, let's say I've made a mistake uh, with that last comment, I can actually correct this. So, you know, let's just call this Nick, whatever. So you notice now that last comment has been updated. So that's a really handy thing to do for you. You don't have to like, you know, you don't have to go back and find the comment. You, if it's edited, you can go there and just re-edit the, the last comment for you. Other options here. So let's um, go back to all the channels. Um, if I just zoom out a little bit more to show you the comments. Um, you can notice here with these channels, if I want, I, I by default all channels, but if I want, I can actually move the comment to any channel that I desire. So I can do that as well. And the option here we have, um, jump to last, this option here talks more about the recording. So what, it will, what, what, what this does for you is gives you a bit of properties of that annotation. It gives you a little window of where it is. You can use your scroll wheel to zoom in and out to show you where the annotation was. Uh, the annotation itself is highlighted, remember? So if it's hollow, then it's not highlighted, but if it is, if it's, um, if it's actually filled, that means you're selecting the annotation. Um, from there, you can actually choose what color you want. I think this is quite handy to have. Um, this way, if you're you know, dropping a specific type of comment, not only can you obviously um, annotate it to what you want, but you can also add a comment with a, you can also add the color, which just helps you, you know, that way your eye can just find the, the annotation really fast. Uh, the time points here, we can move the annotation by right by left clicking and moving it this way, or we can actually do it this way as well. Uh, we also can change the time by here. We can actually modify um, this as well, and it will go to that exact um, time point based on the time here. And these options here, the three dots you have, give you some more um, detail, specifically with the tags. So as I was mentioning, um, the tags are really important when you are um, trying to tag and helps you collect data. Well, not collect, but search for data is, is probably more of an important term, way of putting it. So in this case, if I said, you know, this is a practice session as my tag. So how this helps me is let's just say, for example, you know, a month down the track, um, you know, I have plenty of recordings and I want to find the uh, annotation, you know, but I can't remember, you know, where it is, but maybe uh, there's a tag that can help me there. And that tag, practice session in this case, if I type it into my recordings, I can actually see the tag pop up. And what that does for me, it will uh, tell me, okay, that tag is in this recording here. So it's a, it's a good way of seeing it. Another way is under the annotations tab. If I go to annotations, I mean, yes, I can look for Nick and it will show up. But if I did, if I wasn't, if I forgot, um, you know, the annotation and what it meant, um, you know, I can just say, look for practice. And what happens is that the Nick um, annotation will pop up because that is connected to that tag. So it's a fairly um, important feature to have. And this way it just saves you time not having to just, you know, constantly type a really long comment or a long annotation. Um, you don't have to worry too much about adding, you know, writing notes in your lab chart book, you know, in your, in your experimental book, you can just add tags to help you search for these and this way it just helps you find the uh, important uh, information down the track. So I'll just close this and we'll go back to my live feed. So you can see there and I'll just click on this to bring that back to how it looks. So that's my annotations. And once again, by th pressing the three dots, I can go back to how it looks there. And just to mention the recording here, so this is just my recording. So the project, remember, that's my theme, pr Practice Nick, and we have multiple recordings here. So I can call this um, Nick Prac 1, 
and that's going to be my recording. And of course, I can also give tags to my recording as well. So if this was an animal experiment, you're adding some sort of a drug, you can add the animal's um, experimental name here, you know, EFD1, whatever. I know all the mice and rats have different um, those sorts of codes. And, uh, you know, you can add, if you like, a, a dosage of a drug, you name it, you can do it that way too. And as I'm just using a one particular, as I'm the only subject, I'm, it's a single subject here. Um, I don't need to choose multiple. It's only I choose multiple if I have multiple subjects running at the same time. So if you're doing something like, um, you know, telemetry possibly or some other um, devices that have multiple subjects, this is when um, you choose that option there. And we also have the option, if you press this option here, you can uh, add more channels here as well. But you can also do that by right-clicking and adding channels here as well. So that's um, how we, we can see that. So let's just now talk a little bit more about um, the next thing, which will be our unit conversion. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna make this a little bit higher and I'm gonna show this one only, the blue. So this is gonna be my bridge amp. So if I go to my signal, uh, we've already spoken about what sampling is. So we're gonna go here, BP transducer. Going to keep that as blue. If we go to sampling. Uh, what we're going to do first is that it's not recognizing it because it needs to stop sampling first. Now we're going to go back to the transducer and we're going to go to sampling. And you can clearly see the signal there. And once again, I have my sampling in at 1K. But now we're going to modify this range. So what I'm going to do is the transducer is connected to uh, pressure. Um, pressure calibration device. So something, like, it's just connected to a syringe and a little cuff that shows me a gauge. So that way I can actually equate the millivolts that you're gonna see here to the correct pressure. So if I just adjust the syringe, you can't really see anything as the range is too high. But if I drop this down to, let's just say 50 millivolts, you can, now you can start seeing the pressure change right there, but that's still a little bit too small. So we're gonna just adjust it down to 20. All right, that's really nice there. So you can clearly see that as I'm modifying the pressure within this closed loop with the syringe that's connected like to a tubing to the gauge and the date gauge, then all that tubing connected to the pressure transducer, which is then connected to the bridge amp <laughs> and the power lab. Um, but trust me, it's a fairly simple system. Um, but what you can see here clearly is that there, it is clearly showing um, that there is a pressure change. So first thing I'm going to do before I do anything is I'm going to make sure the gauge is at zero, which it is, and then I'm going to click on automatic zero. That will zero for me. And don't need a mains filter at the moment, but I would recommend that if the signal is getting um, noisy for you but in this case it's a closed loop so we won't have to actually do anything with it so we click apply so now we're just going to press start with the recording and what i'm going to do now is i'm going to do a two-point calibration so the first thing i'm going to do is do a calibration at 60 millimeters of mercury hold that for a few seconds and then i'm going to go to 100 millimeters of mercury and then hold that for a few seconds and then i'll do my calibration that way and then after that I can talk about the, uh, the readout. So just move that, that to 60. Okay, holding there. Okay, moving to 100. Okay, that's it, looks good. So press stop now, gonna hide that area. Gonna go to my signal and gonna go to unit. Now you can see what I've selected. So first thing I'm gonna do is you know, select that region there. It looks pretty um, horizontal, it looks very consistent. I'm gonna set that as set point one. That was 60 millimeters of mercury. I put 60 there. And then the second point is here. I'm gonna choose that there and I'm gonna set that as set point two. That's 100. And now I'm gonna change that to millimeters of mercury. Unit's conversion is clicked on, we obviously, and that's gonna be for all new data. And if I click apply a preview, 
what that shows me the value. So you can see there that it's showing 60 and it's also showing 100 in that selection. So let's click apply. Okay. So now let's press start. And what you're going to see now is that clearly it's showing me my values there. So if I zoom in a little, what I'm going to show you now is, look, if you see that, if you can't really see the value there. It's not too handy for you. So what we have here is uh, the readout option. We click on this. What this shows me now is my life um, value of the blood pressure transducer. So that, you've got to trust me, that is actually at 36 millimeters of mercury right now on, on the um, transducer. So what we see here is the value 36, um, the signal name, uh, the units, and this is my trend line. So it's telling me if it's going up or down. We can check, we can modify a few things with this cogwheel. So if we want, we can re uh, remove the name or keep it there. We can remove the unit, keep it there, or we can remove the trend line. So if you want, you can remove everything and just have the value. You can do that, no worries. So let's just keep uh, this and remove the units, keep the trend line. Um, don't need to change anything. Put one decimal point, and uh, here we're going to have an average. So it's, well, we're not going to have an average because we want to know the exact feed. But this is actually quite handy when you're looking at things like cycle measurements. Um, but you can actually have an, this. What this does is simply collects the data, and you can average it out for you. But if you don't want any averaging, just click, just click fast trend, and that'll do it instantaneously. So what I, what if I do here is if I change this, if I go to if I go to 120 for example, that'll give me. Uh, 120 on the dot, almost there, but yeah. There you can see it's clearly a good, um, so you can clearly see also with the trend line that as I'm increasing the pressure, the trend line goes up, and as I decrease, the trend line goes down. So that's pretty handy to have that right there for you. So that's the uh, um, readout. Other options we have is, like I mentioned, with the with the um, remove channel. So now we're going to talk about calculations. So what I'm going to do is put all the channels back together and go back to this one. So let's uh, keep this. I'll show this one first. So with the calculations, well, we can do some calculations with this particular recording. So one thing we can do is if we go here. We go to add calculated signal. What this does, it provides us a really easy window um, to understand how calculations work. So what you see is in red is what the input is. So that is the ECG. And the blue, so this color here is random. It can be any color, it can, you know, whatever. It can be any color. But for this particular case, it is um, this color here. So what you see on the right here, if I just scroll in and out, you can see my signal, if I go to the scale, same thing. But if you notice really closely, there's two values that pop up. Uh, so that means that the values are superimposed on top of each other. But once I add a calculation, the calculation will be in between these two, the input and the output. And that's what we're gonna see here. So to go to calculations, um, we can go to the drop down menu and here it provides us the most common calculations you'll use in your data. So differentiation, integrals, uh, digital filters. So these filters are more to do with um, conditioning your signal. If you notice something that's noisy or if you want to get a specific frequency, it's quite handy to have. Shift in the data, if you want, you can do that. Um, and also smoothing the data. So if, the, if, the, if you notice the data is quite noisy, um, smoothing can be a really powerful tool to use. And the cyclic measurements, which is a very handy tool to have as this can Help us not only find out rates, but um, periods, heights, um, averages, and um, also can look into derivatives or spikes. Can, that way you can actually look into specific events, indicators. You can drop uh, little markers down. So in this case, as we know with this ECG, the, um, the R wave, or the, the tip of the R wave, is how we can actually measure heart rate. So if we go to psychic measurements and rate, what you'll see is it's calculating the rate for us. Now, it's using a standard deviation of two, but you'll notice that um, what we can do under detection settings, we can actually modify this 
to human and a modifier to a human ECG. So what you'll see is that these event markers that pop up only pop up on the R wave. If, for example, it didn't um, give you uh, the correct um, dropping of the event marker, you can modify this under send deviation. So that means that, let's say, for example, this is one. Well, in this case, it's working, or it's working okay, but in some regards, if you modify this, if it's too low, it can pick up multiple events. So it may have sometimes picked up the T wave, but in this case, it's not. But if it does, you can modify this under the same deviation value. So let's add that to the data. So what you're gonna see now, if I zoom out, is this is my cyclic measurements. So this is measuring the heart rate at the moment. If I go here, you can see that's the um, calculation. If I just change that to heart rate, we can always go back to the calculation by pressing these three dots. What we can do is show the readout. So this is where the readout's really important. So what you can see here is showing me my heart rate at this stage. So it's a little bit higher than it normally is, but that's totally fine. And you can clearly see my heart rate there and the values. We can modify this <clears throat> to show you my average time if I want. So let's just say five second average. And this way it shows me my average heart rate at that time. It's stabilized at about 80. And of course, if I want, if I didn't want to have it there, I can always you know, move my signal and move the heart rate into a separate channel as well. And by double clicking on the scale, I can auto scale, but also I can do it here by going to auto scale, or I can go right click and auto scale there. So there's multiple ways that you can auto scale your data. So you can clearly see the heart rate there. A fairly effective tool to use. Let's go through some more examples of calculations you may encounter with your data. So I'm just gonna stop this and I'm just gonna to go to another project. So this is where I've like prepared some other calculations you know, before. So I'm just going to go to file uh, recent projects and I'm going to go to demo project. So the demo project shows me a few different calculations. One of these, um, let's say the red calculation here you see, that's actually my ventricular pressure is, is in red. And the blue, that one is my, is my derivative. So what you see here is that whenever there as we know with derivatives, this is going to be a first order derivative, but you can change this to a second order, third order, etc. Um, with this particular derivative, so remember, this is our input, this is our output, and this is a calculation. So that is what is going into to provide the output here. So here you can clearly see as it's, it's actually really effective having the differentiation with the ventricular pressure here, because you can see the maximum dp dt, so the max, maximum rate of change is at the peak. So you can see it right there, it's 66 millimeters of mercury when it's at its peak. And then the, the minimum or the maximum um, drop in this uh, waveform of this ventricular pressure is at 80. You can clearly see it there. So it's a lovely little wave you can see um, for your data. And if you want, you can just modify that under three dots. And you can, in this case, if you want, you can actually change this. So. Uh, the width just talks about, you know, how smooth the, the, the line is. If you want, you can make that a little bit higher and that just smooths the data out a bit more. But if you made it too low, then it makes things a little bit, uh, a bit more uh, noisy. You can also change that to a second order. You know, if you want, you can do that. And here you can just modify the width to make it a little bit more smooth. So here you can just see the second order derivative, really easy to use. Here's another example of a calculation. Uh, this is with an arterial pressure. Uh, this particular calculation I have basically looks into the a mean arterial pressure. So once again, it's another cyclic measurement here. <coughs> uh, but here we can clearly see the mean arterial pressure of this uh, particular waveform. If I zoom out, you can see the mean arterial pressure there. And with this, then I can collect my data by just selecting a region and pressing add and We'll be going through that in the next webinar series of how to collect that data to actually put and analyze it later on. Finally, we can go through a couple more um, calculations. So this one just looks at an integral. So these are some fourth breaths that you will see. 
And um, with these, I've just added a basic calculation of an integrate, um, a set integral of um, the volume of this flow. This is using spirometry. And finally, here's one where I've put some basic calculations of um, looking into a EEG signal. That's a raw one in the red. And these different colors are just, are, they're just filters. So if I go here, I have a bandpass filter I've applied. And here I can, if I know my specific alpha wave frequency, which I know is between 13 and seven, it gives me the alpha wave. And you can clearly see it there. And the beta wave, the same thing as another bandpass, a different frequency. And of course, if I want to, I can just superimpose these together. That's not a problem as well. And finally, this little, this little one here, the RMS, uh, that's a root mean squared, which is very effective in um, when you are looking at things like EEGs. So this one here was a little bit more complicated, but we will talk about this in another webinar series where by clicking on this option here, what you can do is you can actually um, add these calculations together in a way that you can get um, any type of calculation that you desire. So here we've added calculations of one on top of each other. And we have a library here of different types of calculations. You can search for them in the search engine or under the drop-down menu. And by clicking on any of these, we can just click on this and just drag it in and we can perform calculations. So that's a simple um, uh, overview of how calculations work. And I will talk more about this in another webinar in the future. Okay, that's um, signal conditioning for today. So uh, if you guys have any comments, I'm more than happy to, or any questions, I'm more than happy to answer anything you like. Okay, there's one question here by Ricardo. What is the mains filter specifically doing in the signal? Okay, the mains filter itself um, is a dynamic signal. So what it does, it uh, filters out the mains frequency, which is 50 hertz. So 50 hertz is a, is a basic noise that can be either to, with um, you know, lights in, in the room or you know, just the, the, the basic frequency all around you. So by removing that frequency, which is done by, it's all done within the Power Lab. So in the Power Lab, um, when you click the recording, when you click on mains filter, it will provide a small template of the actual signal. And then any um, signal that is incoming, it'll compare it to that template. And the template um, removes the 50 Hertz noise. And that's all it does. So if I actually, um, zoom in more here and press start again. What you'll see is first it's noisy, but then with the mains filter, it applies the 50 Hertz noise conditioning and it removes it and makes it a bit um, cleaner for you. So you can clearly see it's cleaner now than it was a bit earlier on. So that's what the mains filter is. Any more questions? No, it's totally fine. Um, if we, I'm just gonna, this, I'll be finishing the webinar now, but um, the next one will be on um, collecting data using your regions and um, how the table view works here, this option here with a cross file analysis. So this way, essentially we can have, you know, up to multiple, as many recorders as you want, and you can actually collect data from each of these, re of the, of these recordings and put it together in the same table. And this way it's easy to do your cross file analysis without having to worry about putting all your data into Excel and then um, you know, worrying about just going through all those steps. You can actually do that all within Lightning. And this is one of the most important features of Lightning, which we'll go through in a, in a, in a fortnight. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, this will be on demand. So I will make sure that you all have this. and. Um, and you can send it to your other colleagues. If you have any questions, please email me and um, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much.